Hi, everyone. My name is John Larimer, and I'm a security engineer on the Android team based out of sunny Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Kenny Root. I'm a software engineer on the Android team. So we're here today to talk to you about security and privacy and the Android apps that you guys are developing and publishing. And we're going to dig right in. Uh, so first of all, let's talk about why you need to take security into account when you're writing apps and why it's important to protect your apps, uh, your apps and your users' data. I'm sure you've all seen the headlines. There's a major security breach here, a major privacy leak there. Uh, some popular mobile app uh, gets caught collecting too much data. The users are furious. The blogosphere is freaking out. The media demands answers. And even the politicians are getting involved to speak their mind. So this is pretty serious stuff. When stories like this hit the mainstream news outlets and people talk about it in bars and in taxi cabs, it shows that people really are paying attention to the privacy practices and security issues in mobile apps today. And it would really ruin your day if you woke up one morning and saw the headline that was about your app that your company produced that you actually spent time developing. Uh, you, wrote, you don't really want the wake-up call from your boss with PR and legal on the line uh, asking what's going on and what you're planning on doing to fix it. And the problem isn't really that developers are collecting personal, uh, personal user data. Sometimes a fundamental uh, feature of your app requires it. The problem is the lack of transparency. And the problem is not notifying the users of uh, the data you're collecting and what it's being used for. And even if you aren't purposely collecting uh, personal data without telling users, your app could still allow an accidental uh, personal data leak if you aren't taking security into consideration. If your app stores or transmits any personal data insecurely, malware authors or hackers could end up using this data without you or your users knowing. Um, and if your app is collecting too much data, or even if it has access to too much data through the, uh, per through the permissions that it requests, people start to worry. And they, they have the right to worry, and they really should be worrying. So how many of you guys have seen negative reviews on your apps because of the amount of permissions that your app needs? A few of you, probably a lot of you. Some of you aren't raising your hands. But uh, <laughs> I, I see a lot of these reviews all the time. But so my point is that people are getting more and more distrustful of apps that ask for access to their personal data without any clear reason for uh, what you're planning on using it for. So our talk today is about uh, how you can write apps with privacy, privacy and security in mind. And we'll talk about ways uh, to protect your app's data from malicious apps that are on the device and how to prevent your app from being a springboard for privilege elevation attacks or information leaks. And we'll tell you ways that you can minimize the number of permissions that your app requests and uh, so you can lower the impact of a potential attack. And we'll talk about the tools and the documentation that we have to help you write secure apps. So people today, they use their phones for everything now. They surf the web, they read their email, they take pictures, they get driving directions, they interact with all of their friends through their social networks. And people can customize the way that they do these things by installing different apps. But for these apps to work, they need to have access to the data that basically defines your life, uh, your list of friends, your location on the planet, where you're going and where you've been, and who you're talking to. So mobile devices are very powerful now, but they're also a treasure trove of very private personal data on the phone's owner and even all of the phone owner's friends. So Android just doesn't hand out this data to anyone that wants it. As you undoubtedly already know, being Android developers, the Android permission system protects the data and the capabilities on your phone. So when a user installs an app that wants to access some of this data or some capability of the phone, uh, the user gets to see the data and the capabilities that you're wanting to access. For example, if your app wants to send SMS messages, the user can see that your app wants to do this um, through the uh, permission system. And if somebody wants to download a game and they see that it's requesting access to read all of your contacts and send SMS messages, uh, a lot of times they'll think twice about downloading it. So when you write an app that accesses the data on a device or even produces data on a device, for example, a social networking app where a user enters their own content, you need to take very good care of this data and you need to be a good data custodian. Um, there are bad guys out there that would love to abuse this data for purposes that the user never really intended it for. And first of all, people generally don't like giving out their personal information to strangers. Um, they really hate it. You can go ask someone on the street for their name and their email address and their phone number and see if they'll give it to you. And they probably won't. You can ask them for a list of all of their friends and all of their friends' phone numbers, but they're not going to give this data. But it seems like a lot of develop app developers are expecting people to just hand over all this information for no reason. 
And uh, besides the general discomfort involved in giving out all this personal data, people need to worry about the, uh, those folks that write malicious software, the malware authors who write apps that try, to, that try to mine mobile devices for data. So what do the bad guys really want to do with uh, all of the, with, uh, if they get a piece of malware on a user's phone? Well, the, uh, the user's phone number and email address could be harvested for sending unsolicited advertisements, robocalls, and spam emails. Um, their contacts could be collected too, so all of their friends start getting spam emails. And uh, the more unscrupulous or black hat marketers and spammers will pay big bucks for collections of detailed personal information on lots of people. But that's really not the only way to make money from having access to a mobile device. There are criminals out there that want to take advantage of uh, your users' phones to send premium SMS messages that directly charge your phone bill. And then there are the uh, real serious criminals out there that would love to transfer money directly out of your bank account. For example, uh, intercepting the two-factor authentication messages that your bank sends uh, over SMS. So these are just a few of the reasons that the data and capabilities on Android devices really need to be protected. But so what does this have to do with the apps that you write? And didn't I just get done saying that Android protects all of this data? Well, even well-intentioned apps that are insecure could end up leaking data and uh, other device access to malicious apps. And when a user installs your app and they approve access to the permissions that you request, they're trusting you with that data and those device capabilities. Um, they, have, they have faith that you aren't going to leak this data to bad apps and that their email address won't start getting spammed because of your app. And they're trusting that all of their contacts won't be sent unsolicited SMS messages because of your app. Uh, so the goal of this talk is really to make sure that you don't let those users down. So you really need to be aware that um, if your app requests a permission, uh, a security vulnerability in the app can end up granting equivalent access to another app that doesn't request that permission. So if you aren't, even if you aren't willfully violating your user's privacy, a mistake in your code could end up leading to some other uh, bad actor doing that kind of thing. So one example of I, ha I have of this kind of security vulnerability is, um, uh, for example, storing the latest GPS location in a world-readable file. And I've seen this a few times, and maybe your app does this. Hopefully it doesn't. If it does, you should um, go fix it immediately after the session. Um, so if you store the GPS location in a file that any app can read, this means that another app can access the phone's location without requesting either of the access location permissions, either access course location or access find location. Um, you're basically removing the effectiveness of the location permission that Android normally requires to read the location data. Another example would be uh, exporting a content provider that stores sensitive personal information. So let's say that you are developing a note-taking app where the user can take notes and save their notes, and you might implement a content provider um, so the different components of your app can all access these notes through a uniform API. And if this content provider is exported and doesn't require any permissions, then uh, that means that any app on the phone could end up reading the user's private notes. And the user could be keeping like really private, sensitive stuff in here, and they might not have any idea that you're making it available to any other app that's on the phone. And um, you, could think, you could think that you're being really smart and uh, encrypting the backing store for the file or encrypting the database and thinking that the malware authors or the hackers won't be able to access it. But if you're providing an open API where any app can read the data, then um, your encryption is basically worthless, your users are still at risk, and your app is really a security headline waiting to happen. And uh, so another one that we see a lot is logging personal information in the uh, log catalogs. We've seen people logging email addresses or even passwords to the log catalogs. And it's usually just leftover lines of code from debugging that people forget to remove, but it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty serious problem. And we have made some improvements to the logging system in Jelly Bean um, to prevent this kind of thing from being abused. So uh, apps in Jelly Bean can no longer read uh, the log catalogs for other apps, which is good, but it's still a very bad idea to log any personal data to the log catalogs regardless of that. Besides worrying about other malicious apps interacting with your apps, you need to watch what you do over the network. Um, sending unencrypted personal data over a wireless network is really bad, so you should be using encryption whenever possible. If you're transmitting data over an unencrypted link, uh, you might as well be broadcasting it to the world. So imagine your users walking around with a billboard floating over their head, showing all of their personal information and uh, the contents of their documents or even their contacts' personal information. So like I said, this is bad. You need to encrypt any, anything that goes over a wireless network. And then there's, uh, there's also the issue of lost or stolen phones. And it's, it's really up to the user to protect access to their physical device. 
but making your app more secure can still help here because you don't want to accidentally provide a, back, uh, provide a back door into someone, uh, someone's phone if they lose control over it. So that's what our talk is about today. And we're going to get into more detail about these possible security uh, holes and how to prevent them. So if you pay attention to what we're saying, hopefully you won't have to worry about dealing with the consequences of a major security or privacy breach, breach with your app. So the first piece of advice I want to give you is that you really need to let your users know what you're doing with their data. If your app is transmitting or collecting any user data, meaning any data that you get from the phone by requesting permission, or uh, any data that the user manually enters into the app, make sure that you have a privacy policy. Uh, we, allow uploading of a, we allow uploading privacy policies to the Play Store now so that users can read it before downloading the app, so you don't have to implement your own sort of UI for showing the privacy policy. So this helps you be more upfront and transparent, and uh, uh, most users really appreciate this kind of thing. And the privacy policy should spell out uh, exactly what data you collect. And I really mean exactly. So if you're collecting email addresses and names, say names and email addresses. If you're collecting phone numbers, say phone numbers. Don't just provide a blanket policy that says that you're going to collect whatever data you want and do whatever you want with it, because that's just not useful and you might as well not even have a privacy policy at that point. Uh, something else that you want to do, it's a pretty good idea to give users a choice. If you want to collect all of their contacts for some reason, ask them um, and let them know why you want this information. Um, let them know what benefit that you're providing to them in exchange for this data. And you should really give the users an option to select which data they want to give you. All or nothing isn't a great option, so uh, let them select a subset of the contacts that they want to share with your, with your app. Uh, but really, the most important thing that you need to do is just be transparent about what data your, your app collects and what you're doing with it. So something else that's really important to keeping your app secure is keeping your developer account itself secure. The Play Store Developer Console lets you upload apps and publish your apps and update your apps. So you really need to protect your account. If someone else gets ac access to it, they can publish apps as you, which if they publish some really bad apps, it would make you look pretty bad. Um, they could also get access to your financial data. They'll see how much money you make from selling your apps and all of your in-app content. So one of the best ways to prevent unauthorized access is by using two-factor authentication. You can download the Google Authenticator app from your phone and require a one-time password when you log in to your uh, Google account. Um, and if you don't have two-factor authentication enabled for your del uh, developer account, that's another one of those things where uh, after the session you should go enable it because it's really one of the most effective things you can do to protect your account. Uh, so another tip is if you want to give another employee or a, uh, pa or a partner access to your developer account, don't give them your password. We've seen this happen, and it really kind of scares me when people do this kind of thing. Um, so we added the ability to grant access to other accounts to your main developer account. So you don't have to give out your password. You can um, grant access by email address, and you get to choose whether or not this person uh, can see the financial data. So you can end up, you can uh, create a single authoritative uh, account for your company, um, and then other accounts can be granted access. And this way, a single rogue employee um, can't take your account hostage. If you're just granting access to other people, you can revoke that access and, without changing the master account password. So uh, if someone leaves the company on bad terms, there's a, it kind of limits, uh, limits the damage that they could do. Next, we're going to talk about the app signing key. And you might ask, what is an app signing key? Well, as Android developers, you've already been using it. You might not have noticed, because in a normal development workflow, in Eclipse, using the ADT or Android developer tools, your app is signed automatically before it's installed on the device. And that's because any app installed on an Android device must be signed with a signature before it's, or must be signed with a private key before it's uh, allowed to be installed. However, if you're distributing your app in the, oops. If you're distributing your app in the uh, Google Play or just sending it via email to someone else, you'll have to generate a release key. And this is a unique key to your app. And it provides, and any update you want to provide for that app must be signed with the same key. Another cool property of this key is if you sign multiple apps with the same key, you can use things such as uh, shared user IDs between the apps to look at, each, other, look at the, each app's data. Or you can use a permission level of signature, which we'll talk about later. Because the sign signing key is part of the app's identity, it can be used to update your app. You really need to make sure that you protect this signing key. So a big company might have something like a hardware security module, or HSM, where they have a little ceremony where they sign the app's keys. I don't know, you might have put on special hats. 
As a homebrew developer, you might just have a, your key on a USB stick that you stick in, stick in your fireproof safe. But the most important part is you need to keep a backup of this key. But whatever you do, don't keep that backup in your source repository or package it in your app. We've seen people do this before, and you're basically giving your private key away to the world. Oh, and by the way, since you have to sign with the same key to have updates, if you lose that release key, you're not going to be able to update your app. You're going to have to tell users to uninstall it and install your new app with a different key. And you can see by the Google search results that it happens quite a lot. And we've even received support calls about this. And I'm sorry we can't factor your key to find the private key again. But uh, you know, I don't want to get a call from you guys about losing your key, because I don't want to tell you sorry that I can't fix your key for you. Now, now that we know how to keep your accounts and your keys secure, let's talk more about Android uh, security itself and the features it offers developers. So the security architecture for Android has several layers. The first layer is each application runs in its own process space and as its own unique user ID. There are some exceptions, such as being signed by the same certificate allows you to run as a shared user ID. But generally, you can imagine that each application is separated by kind of a little firewall between them. It's a process space. This, the Linux kernel provides a separation between the processes and different user IDs, which forms the basis of the Android sandbox. And this sandbox give, de, gives developers the flexibility they need to make wonderful and innovative apps without jumping through hoops to go through different uh, problems they might have. And the sandbox also ensures that apps or interactions between each app component are protected by the appropriate uh, permission check. For instance, if your app was accessing the file system, Linux kernel provides file system security. So what the Linux kernel would do is see what your app's uh, user ID is, what the file's owner is, check the permissions. And if that checks out, it would allow you to read from or write to the file. Or you can imagine, as a developer, you might want to enable Wi-Fi peer-to-peer -peer mode. But you can't talk directly to the Wi-Fi peer-to-peer or the Wi-Fi driver in the kernel. So you'd make a call to the Wi-Fi manager API. So in the back end, this actually uses a binder IPC mechanism or inter-process communication or method to talk to the system server. And the system server would then check your app's permissions, what it was granted when it was installed. And if it's granted, it would talk to the Wi-Fi kernel driver for you on, on your app's behalf and enable Wi-Fi peer-to-peer -peer mode if you have that permission. But it's not limited to calls to the system server. You can provide components to other applications for them to interact with. And you can do something like maybe you have a foreign language word list for an input method editor. Or you could have a matchmaking service for a game to find other opponents. You could provide a simple interface for a complex communication protocol like Secure Shell. Or you could have a uh, calendar provider that goes up to the cloud to grab your new next appointment. You know, it's really limited to whatever you can imagine. Android is unique in that uh, there's freedom within your app's process to do what you need to do. This provides a lot of uh, awesome possibilities, but it's also different from a desktop VM. And I have a kind of a story. I was trying to write a tool for the Android SDK. I thought, you know, I'd just write it in the Java language because it can run on Linux and Windows and Mac OS. But it turns out I ran into a problem. I was trying to use the password-based key derivation function number two. It's kind of a mouthful, but it's PBKDF2. Turns out, in Java, it's only available in some operating systems. I thought, oh, boy. I'll just use my own implementation and provide that through the Java cryptography architecture. But it turns out, in some, GCA, G, or some VMs, you can't install your own JCA provider. And some VMs, you can. So it's kind of a headache. But in Android, you won't have that kind of headache. You can do what you want, need to do, and you'll be much happier. But it also means you have to be aware of some things. You can use reflection in your own application to do what you need to do. And it allows you to do cool things like building dynamic code. But it also means that protections for methods, fields, and classes, like protected and private, aren't absolute. And you can do some really gnarly things in your own code using reflection. I wouldn't really encourage that, though. I'd just stay away from it. Or you can use uh, JNI, which is a native interface for applications. And it's allowed developers to do some really, really cool things like port in the latest uh, game engine or use a third-party library to speed up development. 
but it also means that in native code you can do anything in your own process space. There's not really a restriction. So you can also scribble on the Dalvik managed heap, which can really cause some bizarre behavior. If you're processing things in native code, like uh, images or anything, you can inadvertently cause a security exploit by allowing your buffer overflow. In the worst case, you'll provide the security overflow. It might just have a segmentation fault. It can cause other really bizarre behavior. So next, we'll talk about what it takes to actually write a secure app. And we'll talk about the potential problems you might face and the solutions for those problems. And we'll tell you the best practices that you can employ to take advantage of all the security features that the Android platform uh, framework and operating system offers. So here's a typical application. It has a few activities. There's a service uh, running in the background. The service talks, the service has a settings file that it reads and writes to. There's a database with a content provider that provides access to it. The app is internet enabled and it talks to the cloud. So when you look at this diagram, can you tell where the attack surface is? Uh, which of these components could have a security vulnerability or some kind of data leak that would leak um, data or capabilities from Android? And the answer is all of them. Um, every single component here could be exposing data if the developer, uh, if you guys aren't taking the necessary precautions. The activities could be leaking personal data to the log file. The service can accept remote calls from other apps that, are, uh, that don't have permission. The settings file could be world readable or world writable, allowing um, access to the service. The content provider could be granting access to the database, and the database file itself could have insecure file system permissions. And even the data being transmitted over the network could be in clear text, or the web service itself could be compromised. Now, this, this isn't really as scary as it looks. Android actually makes it pretty easy to, to prevent most of these kind of attacks, except for the, uh, the cloud one there. We can't really protect your web server. Um, but it's often easier to write a secure app in Android than it is to write an insecure app. Um, you just need to know what to do. You need to know what's safe and what's not safe. And once you really understand the risks and the security model of Android, it starts to become like second nature, and we do have some tools to help keep you on track. So now Kenny will tell you about the different types of application components and how to protect other apps from accessing them if you do not want other apps to access them. So each component provided by your app is declared in the Android manifest. And this is a way in which the system server, and specifically the activity manager and package manager inside the system server, uh, knows the entry points to your apps. And these entry points can be services, activities, broadcast receivers, or content providers. And each one of these components can have intent filters associated with them, which tells the system server which, which intent data you want these activities or services or whatever being matched for. An intent filter signals to the Android system that you want these uh, components exposed to other apps. And without an intent filter, most components are not available to other applications, with the exception of the content provider, which is exported by default. So it's a good idea to get in the habit of explicitly marking components as exported or not. This is not strictly necessary, but it'll help you prevent mistakes that you make in the future. For instance, if you didn't intend an or a component to be exported, and maybe seven months later you come back or a coworker comes in there and adds an intent filter for something they need, they might inadvertently export that component and it could cause a uh, security vulnerability later. If you do wish to make your, oops, I'm on the wrong side. Okay. So if you do wish to make your, uh, your components available, but only for limited use, there are permissions you can grant in the Android manifest.xml. These may be listed to the user upon installation. Uh, if they're, depending on the protection level they're at. So if you have a protection level normal, it's for permissions that you're granting to an application that don't really expose any user data, but you might want the user to be aware of if you're scrolling through the list of permissions that are in there. Uh, dangerous is for things that could expose user data and you do want the user to be aware of. And finally, there's a permission level of signature which allows you to provide uh, components to other applications signed by the same app signing keys we discussed before. So here's an example of how you define a permission on the Android manifest. It shows that protection level is restricted to, restricted to signature, and it's, that means the same app signing key that you signed this app with, and it's protecting our service example. So if you didn't want the service example available to other applications it's, or exported, it's a good idea to leave that signature in there and just mark exported false. 
This is kind of a belt and suspenders approach, and it just ensures that if there's any problem with the uh, exporting in previous platform versions, then uh, it's not exported. You have to have the same signing signature. So the Android manifest provides really coarse uh, permission checking. It's basically all or nothing for some things. But if you need to check individual paths of your code, there's more granular things you can do with checking in code. For instance, if you register a broadcast receiver in your code, there's a version of the API that specifies what permission the caller must have before they're allowed to invoke that component. If you're receiving a uh, binder call, say through your AIDL file, you can use the enforce calling permissions or check calling permissions methods to check whether the caller has the appropriate permissions. And this allows you to avoid the confused deputy problem. So what's a confused deputy problem? So we have our Wi-Fi manager here, which is inside the system server, which I call the strict sheriff. And say you wanted to make a Wi-Fi control app that enables Wi-Fi peer-to-peer -peer mode like we were discussing before. So if your app asked the strict sheriff here whether he's allowed to do it, he'd be granted. If you installed an attacker app that requested no such permission and he asked the strict sheriff, it would be denied. But what happens if your app is exposing a component that is part of the uh, Wi-Fi control and the attacker decides that he can ask your app? Well, your app might be asked by the attacker app. It would ask the strict sheriff. He would grant it because you asked for the permission during installation. And your app could return some information back to the attacker app without having the correct permission. And your app has become the confused deputy. He's been deputized by the strict sheriff, and he's leaked information to the other app without the correct permission. So now I would like to talk about protecting your app's data from people with physical access to the device. And I don't mean the users that installed your app. They generally have every right to access all the data that your app's storing on, on the device on their behalf. But I'm talking about people who maybe found or stole the phone from someone. Uh, the Android debuggable attribute in the Android manifest.xml file turns on debugging for your app. And you want to make sure that this isn't enabled, isn't enabled in release builds of your app. And it's usually automatically disabled when you create a release APK. But if you've been messing around with the build process, it's possible to release an APK with an enabled. And we have seen apps that were released with uh, the debug setting enabled. And if it is enabled, someone with debug access to the device, uh, if ADB is enabled and USB debugging is enabled, uh, they can actually run code with the same permissions as your app and read all of your app's data. Uh, here you can see how easy it is. It takes a single uh, shell command to run another shell as the user's uh, user ID, giving it access to the private secrets file that is full of secrets. And uh, some, so something else that's worth mentioning is the Android allow backup attribute, which isn't on this slide, but um, it specifies that your app allows its private data to be backed up by the Android backup system. And in my opinion, this is usually a pretty good thing. Users like being able to back up their data, but you need to keep in mind that someone with ADB access to the device can run ADB backup and dump, all of, uh, dump the backup file with all of the app's private data to get access to this data. Uh, like I said, this, it's usually a good thing in most cases, but if you have some extremely sensitive information that you wouldn't want someone who stole the phone to have access to, um, then uh, you might want not to allow backups. Now let's talk about storing data, and in particular, storing data in the files on the file system. So when you store personal data, or data that's protected by a permission, you need to make sure that you aren't leaking this data to other apps. And the example I gave at the beginning of this talk was storing the latest GPS location in a world-readable file. But really, if there's any information that you retrieve from Android that requires a permission to access, or any data that the user enters into your app, you don't want it to be world-readable. And you also need to watch out for ex uh, when you're using external storage. In Android, the external storage, or the SD card, isn't protected by the same set of granular per-app permissions that private app files get. And it was designed to be used as shared storage where any app can access it. And in Jelly Bean, we added the ability to uh, protect external storage with a permission, but any app can request this permission. Um, so this means that if your app is handling any personal or private data, it really sh you really shouldn't store it on external storage or the SD card without asking the user first and making sure that they're aware that any other app can access this data. Another important thing I'd like to say is that you can't trust files that uh, any other app can write to. 
It's usually a bad idea to create a world writable file anyways, but other apps can still get access to write the files that your app stores in external storage. The, the right external storage permission allows this. And I have a couple of few really big don'ts here. Uh, if you're using any code libraries or external libraries, don't place the code anywhere that can be written to by other apps. Um, uh, another one is uh, don't write paths to code libraries in world writable files because then an app could just load that file, change the path of the file to uh, a library that they control, and then your app would end up loading that uh, binary library into their own process space and uh, it could be possibly malicious in executing in the context of your app with all of your app's permissions running as your app's user ID. And this has actually happened before in some very popular apps. If you're going to be uh, reading world writable data, you shouldn't do it with native code. Um, Delvic offers protection against memory corruption vulnerabilities that are really hard to prevent in native code. Um, it takes a lot of effort. Uh, and by memory corruption vulnerabilities, I mean the things like buffer overflows or integer overflows um, that lead to arbitrary code execution. Here's an example of some good and some bad code for handling private data files. And you can see here that it's pretty easy to make sure that uh, other apps can't read, or, can't read or write to your files. And it's actually less characters to type uh, mode private than mode world readable, so it uh, actually takes a little bit more effort to write the apps insecurely. And the default value is actually zero, so you could just use zero instead of context mode private. So, um, yeah, so you need to put a little bit of extra effort into making your apps insecure, so that's one of the examples of it's actually easier to make our secure app slightly, very slightly easier. Um, so something else that you might consider to protect your files uh, from being accessed is encryption, but Kenny would like to say a few words about that. So as John mentioned, permissions don't work on the SD card because the file system used on the SD card for maximum com compatibility with consumer electronic devices like your camera where you put the SD card in uh, doesn't support the concept of file owners. So, you might think to yourself, I know, I'll just encrypt the files I put on the SD card, then no bad guy will be able to read them. Well, the problem is that there's something called, like, the, there's some attacks, and one of them is called the chosen ciphertext attack. So what might happen is you encrypt your login OK equals zero in this example, but if the bad guy knows that it's always going to be login OK equals something, or he can guess kind of the pattern of the file, he can XOR it with the data he thinks it is, and then XOR it with the data he wants it to be, and then when you later decrypt that file, it'll become what he wants it to be. That's not a good idea. So a lot of this problem comes from uh, trying to compose your own cryptography primitives without really understanding the consequences and the pitfalls you might run into. So it's a good idea just to use something that's been peer-reviewed already, and one such library is Keysar. Keysar is written by the Google security team, and it's made available under the Apache 2.0 license. And it can handle encryption and decryption, signing and verification of files without much guesswork as to how to actually use it. For instance, on the slide, there's a Keysar tool you run to create a key pair, the public and private part. You take that public part, put it in your raw resources, and later on in your application, after you've packaged up that public key, you can, if you need to send uh, data to your server later, you can encrypt your private data. You can store it away for a while if you want to, but later on you can send it up to your server, and on the server use Keysar to decrypt it. And it's really only two lines of code, and so it's a lot easier than instantiating a lot of the Java cryptography objects. And every API should be that simple in my opinion. I'm working on it, but... Uh... So just to show how tricky crypto can be, in 1970s, Ron Rivest, uh, Adi Shamir, and Lynn Edelman took about 42 tries to get RSA right. Those are the RSNA and RSA. And that means they got it wrong 41 times beforehand. And these guys are experts. They've been researching cryptography for a long time. So it just shows how easy it is to get things wrong. And more recently, NIST has opened up the competition for the secure hash algorithm, uh, version 3 or SHA-3. 64 people entered that, and immediately cryptanalysts were attacking the, the algorithms. Some were broken immediately, some were deemed too slow, and some just uh, not secure enough for the competition. Now in the third round, there's five people left, so that means you know 59 people got some things wrong. And I just don't want to see anyone in this room end up in the same uh, area, so just use something like cryptography, or keys are for your cryptography. And just to paraphrase a one of my favorite games, 
It's dangerous to go alone. Take your own peer, take this peer verified cryptography library with you. Now I'd like to talk about protecting the network traffic in your app. Most apps will connect to the internet for something. They might be transmitting personal data, and there's nothing particularly wrong about this as long as you include that privacy policy that John talked about. But there's a problem if you're transmitting it uh, unencrypted. Now, you can imagine a public Wi-Fi network. If someone's on a public Wi-Fi network, anyone in the room can basically sniff the traffic on that public Wi-Fi network. And even if you encrypt the public Wi-Fi network, there might be a problem in the network between your server and your client. There could be an attacker in there that uh, could mount what is called a man-in-the-middle attack. And they could even inject data into your application. Like, they could intercept the connection and uh, appear as if you're connecting to the server, but they're injecting malicious data into your application. So you can't really even trust what's coming into your application, even if you know that the local network's uh, encrypted. So what's the worst that can happen if someone hijacks a network stream? Well, I think the best that could happen is that they see pictures of my neighbor's cats instead of the images they're expecting to see. So I like my neighbor's cats, but you can imagine something else happening, like maybe they're injecting malicious data, maybe they're injecting JavaScript into your web view. You know, it could be anything, really. And if you've ever been to a uh, hacker conference like DEF CON or Black Hat in Las Vegas and tried to use the public Wi-Fi, you might have seen something. It might be a little bit less tame than this, but uh, you'll know what I mean. But in the worst case, your app could be completely compromised if it's exposing some JavaScript interface in WebView or whatever you're downloading. Luckily, it's pretty easy to make, to enable encryption if you're using HTTP and Android. Just make sure you use HTTPS instead of HTTP. Just one little letter you put in there, it makes a whole lot of difference. Of course, you need to make sure your server is supporting HTTPS, but that's really outside the scope of this talk, and there's plenty of things on the web you can go and search on how to enable HTTPS or SSL on your server. Something else to keep in mind is that you really shouldn't download code into your program. Android allows this. You can download a DEX file and actually load it into your application's process space but it's a really bad idea security-wise, so I wouldn't really recommend it. And remember the cats from the last slide? Imagine if instead of the DEX file you intended it as some attacker's DEX file that uh, completely compromises your application. Then they'd be able to get access to all the data your app has generated or the permissions that it has granted by the user. If you know what you're doing, you can use cryptographic signing to ensure that nothing like this happens, but as we saw on the previous slide, it's kind of hard to get cryptographic uh, signing right. It's better just to use Android's own updating mechanism uh, to provide the freshest data to your applications. There's a good one in Google Play, by the way. By default, the HTTPS stack in Android will validate SSL certificates against all the CAs included in the Android platform. This is fine, and it provides an adequate level of security by placing your trust in all the trustworthiness of all the CAs, which I don't know if you guys have read the news, but there was a few break-ins in CAs. And when a bad guy breaks into a trusted CA and generates a rogue certificate for a site, if that rogue certificate is used, the user won't be able to tell because it actually validates correctly. But breaking into a CA and generating rogue certificates isn't something that a hobbyist hacker or a script kitty is able to do. These guys are really serious. And and they're usually not after money, they're after information. So if your app is used by people in particularly sensitive areas and you want to protect your app a little bit more, you might want to consider implementing certificate pinning. So certificate pinning is if you know some CA or intermediate certificate in the chain that will never change, you can place that certificate or a group of certificates in a pin set. And then that means you can, or in a pin set and trust only the group instead of everything in the uh, default list. And what's even better is if you control the software which runs on the client, which you obviously do, and the server as well, you can generate your own CA. So then you can save a little bit of money if you're, if you're uh, strapped for cash. But of course, if you generate your own CA, there's some protections you have to put in place. Like I mentioned before, a big corporation might have an HSM for signing capabilities. Uh, typically, they have something like they only take it out certain times of the year. But you should really treat it the same as your uh, application signing key. Make multiple copies, keep a backup, and keep a backup, and keep a backup. But if you want to find more about how to actually pin your certificates, 
You can check the Android doc documentation for HTTPS URL connection. There's some example code in there. So now I'd like to give you some advice for using WebView. And uh, by default, all JavaScript is disabled in WebView, and this is good. Um, when you enable JavaScript, you open up your application to attacks like cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, and uh, people could write um, heap spray exploits for WebKit bugs. Uh, so there's all sorts of bad things that could happen in a web view if JavaScript is enabled. Uh, we don't really have time to get too deep into those specific attacks or how to block those kind of attacks today. It's a little bit it's beyond the scope of this talk and we just don't have time. But um, keep in mind that you should really keep JavaScript disabled in your web view unless there is some fundamental reason that, you, that your app requires it. Because if an attacker can find, way, can find a way to inject arbitrary JavaScript into your application, either through a man-in-the-middle attack like Kenny was talking about, or even compromising your web server, they could end up running code in the context of your app. And this is especially dangerous if your web view exports a JavaScript interface. And the add JavaScript interface method is really dangerous. And what this call does is let you expose your app's functionality through JavaScript. So for example, you could write a method that reads data from a file in your app's private storage, and then posts it back to your server. And then you can, you can make this method available to JavaScript that's running in the web view. And, but if an attacker has any way to control which JavaScript is running in the web view, um, and your code, uh, say your code lets the JavaScript read any file instead of a specific file, like the file name is an argument to the method, then you could have a major information leak on your hands. Because, uh, so if you, if you expose any protected data or any phone capabilities through JavaScript, uh, like I said, a website compromise or a man in the middle attack could end up executing arbitrary code. And there are some legitimate uses for using add JavaScript interface. That's why we put it in there. It's, it's very useful sometimes. So if you do use it, make sure that you're grabbing the JavaScript over HTTPS. Make sure it's an encrypted and authenticated connection. And don't expose anything that's protected by a permission. Make sure that the uh, any information you do expose is extremely limited. So for example, don't provide a generic interface for reading and writing files to JavaScript, and don't expose direct access to um, content providers, and definitely don't uh, expose access to like reflection. Um, so you really want to keep the potential attack surface as small as possible. And something else that we'd uh, like to talk about is minimizing the permissions that your app requests. And you already know that requesting um, too many unnecessary permissions can get you a lot of bad reviews from users. Um, people complain on the forums. But that's really not the only problem with requesting too many permissions in your apps. Recently, a group of university researchers found that one third of the apps that they tested requested more permissions than they needed. And this means that based on the code that was in the apps, they requested permissions that they didn't have any code that used. So there's just extra permissions floating around that weren't really necessary. And this is a problem because if there's a security vulnerability in the app, if an app can run arbitrary code in the context of the app um, using one of the vulnerabilities that we already talked about, then they could take advantage of, the, of any of the permissions that you request. So your app might not be using them, but a malicious app could. So I'd like to show you a few examples of ways that your app can perform common tasks uh, without requesting permissions. And these are things that most people think actually require permission, and I've seen some of this very similar code in apps, and they request a permission that they don't need. And uh, so when I say that you can do these things without requesting permission, I don't mean that you can like, do these things, like access data secretly behind the user's back without asking for permission. The user is fully aware of what's going on. Uh, they're prompted to select a piece of information to share with your app. So in the first example, um, you'll see how you don't need to request a permission yourself if you uh, call an activity that already has the permission that your app needs. And in the second example, you'll see how um, content providers can grant temporary permissions for your app to access some data. So here's one example. Uh, if you want to let the user take a picture with a camera and then read uh, that image data in your app, you don't need the camera permission for your app. You can just launch the system camera activity um, to let the user take a picture and then return control to your own app. So to make this happen, you fire off an action image capture intent and specify uh, whatever output file name that you want. And uh, you can use start activity for result to make sure that your app gets called back with the data whenever the activity is complete. So in this case, after the 
after the user takes the picture, your on activity result callback in your class gets the file path and you can read the file. And so from the user's perspective and from a security and privacy perspective, this is a lot safer than um, granting camera access to the app and writing a bunch of code to interface directly with the uh, camera API. The user gets to pick the photo that's sent to your app. You can't open the camera, uh, you can't read camera data without actually opening the camera and the user seeing it there. So there's really no reason to request the camera permission unless you're actually writing a camera app yourself. Uh, another example is letting the user send an SMS message. Instead of requesting the send SMS permission and going through all of the effort of talking to the telephony manager to send an SMS message, you can just create an intent and start an activity that launches the system SMS app with the number and message that you choose. And this way, the user gets to see the destination phone number and message, and they'll have the option of either sending it or declining to send it if they, if they aren't comfortable with it, or they can change the message. And obviously, this won't work for, an app that has, for every app that has SMS features, um, but if SMS is just a minor part of your app, for example, if you wanna let the user share a link to your app through to one of their contacts through SMS, letting them send the message this way makes a lot of sense, and you don't have to worry about freaking the user out by requiring send SMS permission if that's the only feature that you're really gonna be using it for. Something else that's pretty neat is that content providers can grant temporary permissions to apps. An app can use the action pick or action get content intents to have the system launch an activity that lets the user pick the information they wanna share with your apps. So here's an example. Let's say you wanna get some contact information from the user. So instead of requiring the read contacts permission and spending a bunch of time writing a new uh, widget to let users scroll through the contacts and pick the ones that they want, you can use action get content with the mime type of phone dot content item type and uh, the Android system will pop up a, choose, a contact chooser that lets the user pick which contact they want. Uh, when the user makes their choice, the on activity result callback for your class is called and then you can use a content resolver to read the data that you want. And this works because the context content provider grants a temporary URI-based permission, which we didn't really get into, um, to your app for this one piece of information. Uh, your app can read this contact, but it can't read any others, and they don't have access to, re uh, they don't have access to read the full list, and the user picks the, content th the contact themselves. So I think users will feel much better about this uh, privacy and security-wise than just granting blanket access to your app to read all of the, con the, ent the entire contact list. Uh, another thing I wanna talk about, uh, about minimizing permissions is identifying app installations. And this is a pretty common problem. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why you'd wanna identify unique installations, whether it be for licensing or uh, tracking game scores or um, advertising or even just getting an accurate count of the active users of your app. And people seem to be inclined to use get device ID for this or the SIM serial number or some other hardware based ID. But um, the hardware IDs aren't really great values for tracking installs. The device ID isn't really reliable on um, in some devices and on some custom ROMs it's just set to a fixed value. And uh, there was a very popular phone that shipped that's still very widely used today that had a fixed device ID on every single phone. And there's also the privacy implication that the user can't change this value without buying a new phone. And if someone decides to do a factory reset on their device and sell the phone to someone else, and then the buyer also um, purchases your app, they can see some weird stuff if your app is um, associating that phone with another user. And you, you don't want the new owner of the phone to see all of the old user's personal data if you're storing it keyed on the device ID. And so you could use the Android ID to track installs. It doesn't require permission and it does get changed on a device wipe, but this really still isn't ideal. Uh, my favorite method is uh, security and privacy wise is just to generate a UUID or a universally unique identifier when the app starts up for the first time and then store it in the shared preferences file. Then you can use the Android backup system so the shared preference file for your app is synced uh, up to the cloud. Uh, that way the user can actually wipe the ID if they want. They could go to the system settings and clear your app's data. Um, but if they feel like they need to do a factory reset of their phone, they can do a backup, factory reset their phone, um, resync their device back from the cloud, and the device, the, uh, your ID will still be there and they'll still see the same data from the app. So this is really the best of both worlds. Um, the value is persistent across wipes if the user wants it to be, or they can erase the value if without doing a full factory reset. So it ends up working a lot like a web browser cookie. 
Um, so now let's talk a bit about device administrator access. Uh, the Android device administration API lets anyone uh, develop and publish apps that can control the administrative security features of the device. Uh, things like requiring a lock screen with a complex password or requiring encryption, um, disabling the camera, or doing something fun like wiping the device. So if your app, if your app does request device administrator privileges, it's a, it works a little differently than the, normal, than the normal permission system. Users can actually revoke device administration privileges. And the privileges are also granted on a more granular basis. An app can ask for the ability to enforce the password length or password complexity, but still not be able to wipe the device. And some issues we've seen in the past are that people who install apps that require device administration access, um, they can't uninstall these apps unless device administration is disabled. Um, in Android versions up to Gingerbread, there wasn't really a clear error here. It would just say uninstall failed, and the user would have no idea why they can't install these apps, and they think it's malware. But in Ice Cream Sandwich It Up, the user has the option of going directly to the settings to disable the app. So if you're using, uh, if you're using device administrator access in a normal app and not like an actual enterprise mobile device management solution, uh, for example, if, you, if you're developing a lock screen or a replacement for the default launcher, uh, make sure that your users are aware of the power that they're giving your app. Um, make sure that they know that they have the disabled device administrator privileges to uninstall your app. And I've, I've been saying the whole time that you need to be really careful with security, but um, you should be really careful if your app has access to any of the more dangerous device administrator privileges. Because accidentally leaking someone's private notes or their email address is one thing, but uh, letting some other app wipe the device without permission is a whole different problem, and you really don't want to deal with that. So I don't, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but we recently started a tool, uh, we recently started including a tool called Android Lint with the Android SDK, and it's been there since around version 16 of the development kit tools. And what it does is it scans your Android project source code, the Java and the uh, XML files for potential bugs. And besides normal bugs, like uh, bugs that can crash your program or performance issues, um, Lint actually checks for several potential security issues that we talked about today, too. And Lint is integrated with Eclipse, so if it finds an issue, it'll generate a warning and point the problem out to you with the yellow squiggly line that you probably can't see on the projector um, under Mode World Writable. But when you do see this warning, you can hover the mouse over it and then click a menu option to get more detailed information. And here you can see that the, we're, war we're uh, urging you to carefully review the code that's creating a World Writable file. It tells you not to write any private data to the file, and it lets you know that if the file is modified by malicious code, that it can compromise your entire application. And besides looking for world-readable and world-writable files, Lint also checks for exported application components that can be accessed without permission. And it's not always a vulnerability to export a service or a broadcast receiver or a content provider without permission, and sometimes that's exactly what you're intending to do, but Lint is there to make sure that you know that you're doing it. So when you see these Lint security warnings, whatever you do, don't ignore them. Um, you can suppress the warnings with an annotation. It's just a menu option that adds the code automatically. But re you should really only do that once you understand the, the security issue that, that is causing the warning and you're fully aware of the implications um, that you're, of what you're doing. Um, you could be making a huge mistake by just ignoring a security warning from Lint. And we're also always adding new security checks. So make sure you're always using the latest build of the SDK tools. And the SDK tools are, are uh, um, released independently of the, Androids, of the Android operating system, so it's updated a lot more frequently. And it's also developed mostly in open source, so um, you can check out the source for Lint. If you have ideas for more checks, you can feel free to add them. We'll put them in the source code. So uh, definitely check that out if you haven't seen it. And we do have a lot of documentation on the Android developer site and the Android open source project site, and there's some other good references out there too. The Android security overview site describes the security features in Android and how they're implemented. Um, you should definitely check that out to get a deeper understanding of Android security architecture and some of the underlying features of the operating system that provide the basis for the Android permission model and uh, the various security features that the operating system provides. The Designing for Security page tells you how to write apps with security in mind. And this is probably the most important document that you need to read to um, be able to design and develop your app securely. And on that page, you'll find a lot of the same information that we talked about today. Uh, how to avoid world-readable and world-writable files, um, how to protect your application components, 
and ne encrypted network communications. So definitely take a look at that if you haven't seen it. It's a relatively new document. We just put it up a few months ago or late last year. Uh, so I'm not sure how many people have seen it. Then there's the documentation on the security and permissions in Android. If you do decide to export some of your application components and require permission, definitely read the permissions documentation very thoroughly. Um, it covers all aspects of the permission system and there's a lot of good stuff that you need to know. And something else you might want to check out is a book by Jeff Six called Application Security for the Android Platform. And it's actually pretty short. It's a little over 100 pages, maybe 115 pages. Um, but it's still very thorough, and we'd actually like to think that the short length of this book is really a testament to how easy it is to write secure apps in Android. So thanks, everyone. Uh, if you have any questions about the Android uh, platform security features or general discussion, there's a uh, group called Android Security Discuss on Google Groups. If you want to report a security vulnerability in Android platform or any Google apps, you can always send mail to security at android.com. And we'll probably be doing a Google Hangout, uh, Google Plus Hangout with the uh, Android developer office hours in August sometime. So if you can't think of your question right now, we'll be hanging out with Rito and the other guys uh, on the Google Plus Hangout. So we only have about three minutes left. I might, we might be able to take a few questions, but if you line up at the uh, microphones in the aisle, we'll be able to answer your question. Uh, can you tell us what exactly uh, the device encryption setting does, and also how does rooting affect security? So device encryption, you mean the uh, disk encryption, whole, di whole device encryption? Yes, in the, in, the so to, in the settings. So what it does is it basically turns on, on the low level, it uses the Linux kernel dmcrypt to encrypt the entire slash data partition. And so basically it encrypts it in place. And what was the other part? What is, how does rooting? Rooting. OK. How does rooting affect security? Well, my concern is if somebody's rooted the phone, does an app have access to your uh, data, even if you have that encryption option turned on? It, de it depends on what it does exactly. Uh, basically, when your device is running, it has to access the data. So if, you, if there's an application that runs, it's going to be able to access the data because it's unencrypted to the operating system. If it was totally encrypted for everything, the device would be a, a brick, basically. So if you have root permissions, you could read some other applications. Uh, so you guys have uh, this ability to request a different context in the SDK. Can you explain how that works with your security model and whether or not you, another application can request your resource bundle? Uh, it depends on if you have uh, what's called forward locking. So basically, uh, you can request resources for other applications. This is what allows third-party launchers to work. So if you wanted to make a launcher where you load up an icon or other resources, you have to have that available for other uh, third-party launchers to be able to use. That's why it's there. You can also do things like create add-on processes where you just install an application that doesn't really have any code, but it can have resources that you can load. So you can enable the uh, forward locking, but I think they took it out of the developer console for markets. Sorry, just to be clear, does that mean that other applications can access my resources? Uh, depends on where the resources are, but yeah. Is there more guidance because the documentation online leaves something to be desired? Yeah, I don't know exactly where it'd be, but uh, I'll look it up and get back to you. OK, thanks. Are you guys uh, familiar with SQL Cipher for Android? And if so, uh, what are your impressions? Is it I'm not secure? familiar with it. No, okay. I'm not familiar. What's exact, what is exactly uh, it? It's a, it's a drop-in replacement for SQLite, um, the identical API. So you just use different imports uh, for SQLite database. And it provides encryption of the, the full encryption of the database itself. Yeah, I haven't heard of it. I haven't seen it. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> Somebody All says right, it's good. So. It, it adds, um, adds a bit to the package size. That's all but, you know, at the cost of uh, having yeah. some security. So it adds the package size at the cost yeah. of... Users being mad that it takes up too much room? Actually, Mark Murphy just uh, posted on the Motorola right, dev forum um, 
something about that on the blog. Okay. So. I think I think we have time for one more question in 20 seconds. So. All right. Uh, so, it's my understanding that factory data reset doesn't actually delete uh, users' data or um, do any sort of encryption or anything like that. So I've heard uh, reports of you know people doing factory data reset with with the impression that everything would be completely hidden then, and then someone buying their phone that knew what they were doing. Well, it depends. On some, on some phones, if you don't have an SD card, or if you have an SD card, it won't wipe the SD card, because a lot of people like just take it out when they sell the phone. On phones that have USB storage, which is basically no removable SD card, there's an option in there that says delete everything, including yeah, I, photos. I, I mean, even if you, uh, even the data that it's supposedly deleting, it's actually just marking as yeah. being. If you're really paranoid, you can always enable hold disk encryption. Basically, that throws yeah, away I, the keys. Yeah, I, I have hold. I have my my phone encrypted. I was, I mean, my, my main question is really, is there any, I mean, since it's not uh, really getting rid of that data, is there any steps that we're supposed to be taking to make sure that if someone finds themselves in that situation? The well, data in our apps is still uh, not you, accessible. If you enable hold disk encryption when you do factory reset, it's really getting rid of the data. Okay. All right, thanks. All right, I think okay. we're out of time for questions, but we're going to hang around up here by, on stage, and if you guys have, you can just come up and talk to us. Hilarious.